Good afternoon, everyone. This is Gretchen Patch. I'm the Director of Strategic Health Programs here at the ACSM National Office. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our um, uh, June Brown Bag uh, with Dr. Stuart Lee. Um, I'll introduce Dr. Lee, he'll take it from there, and then we'll have questions at the end. So feel free to type your questions in, um, in the control, kind of in that control panel area, and we'll uh, take those at the end. So Dr. Uh, Stuart Lee has worked in human life sciences at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, since 1992. During his first 16 years at, at the Space Center, he supported research activities in the exercise physiology lab, first as an exercise physiologist, later as technical lead, and finally as senior scientist. Currently, Dr. Lee is lead research scientist for the JSC Cardiovascular and Vision Laboratory. Dr. Lee supports research and medical operations, activities directed toward the human health and performance of astronauts prior to during and after returning from their space flight missions. His research activities are focused on improving our understanding of cardiovascular and muscu musculoskeletal adaptations to space flight and the development of countermeasures to protect astronaut health and performance during space flight and during post-mission readaptation to Earth. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys today. I apologize uh, and give a couple of disclaimers in advance. Uh, number one, uh, I'm not really used to doing webinars yet, so I apologize uh, if uh, it seems a little bit odd in the directions I'm looking. I'm just, it's a little, for, for me, trying to stare at a computer is a little different this way. The other part being that, uh, unfortunately, I had to come home to do the webinar today. I uh, to Due to factors beyond my control. Uh, I'm hoping that we won't be interrupted by any cats today. Um, but so I, I titled this particular talk the, An Accidental Rocket Scientist with a perspective of trying to, to, to relay some a certain certain amount of life lesson and, and a little bit about where I got to where I am and, and what I'm doing now um, in that I wasn't one of the uh, some of my colleagues who always dreamed of working at NASA and, and this was where they always wanted to be I kind of ended up here somewhat um, by accident as it were and so what I'm going to do is first off is a sort of matter of introduction and life lesson um, talk about who I am, how did I get here, and then get into what I do, and and then a little bit about the countermeasures uh, that are currently employed on ISS, as well as some future countermeasures that might be considered. Um, my background, um, is, as many of you probably are, um, now I consider myself a former athlete, but at the time when I started into this field, um, I was very interested in the athletic side of, of exercise physiology with the original intent of becoming a physical therapist or uh, participating in chiropractic care. Um, I was got my degree from Virginia Tech, uh, my bachelor's degree, and left the university to run a hospital wellness center in which I was involved in fitness programming and, and sports coordination. I uh, discovered that my interests were beyond just what I was available to me in that, that particular venue. And so I returned to Virginia Tech and got my master's degree in, as a clinical exercise specialist. Uh, Dr. Bill Herbert, who's been very active in, in ACSM over the years, was my, one of my primary mentors. So I came out of the program with the intent that I was going to cardiac rehabilitation, but an odd thing happened during that time in that in our area, particularly the insurance reimbursement rules for cardiac rehabilitation had changed so that run, a program run specifically by an exercise physiologist or a non-licensed professional, such as a physical therapist or a nurse, um, it became more difficult for those programs. And so I started looking around for other opportunities and I was lucky enough at the time to have a, a colleague, someone actually helped their, their PhD program, um, Dr. Alan Moore, who was already down here at Johnson Space Center doing work. And uh, I was lucky to make contact with him and, and this opportunity presented itself. So the idea here of the introduction being that 
you know, being open to different things and getting a good general background education uh, in exercise physiology, not so much in research, ironically, but more in the clinical side of things, led me down to this rather unique role. When we originally moved down here, the intent was really only to be here for about two to three years, and then I was going to go off and find something else. But I, as I hope you'll gather from this presentation that I have had the opportunity with to you work in such a unique environment with a, a very special group of individuals, not just the astronauts, but the, the scientists and the engineers down here, that I've it's been hard to walk away from this. Um, as a matter of fact, in the next few months, I'll be moving to Dayton, Ohio. Um, my wife will be supporting the Air Force in some similar work, and I just can't walk away from it. So I'll continue to work here, but, but remotely at that point. I guess I'll get more experience at that point on doing remote type activities like we're doing today. As I mentioned, I've had a, a variety of experiences. Um, arriving, the space shuttle program actually started in, in um, 1981, but I didn't arrive until 1992. And I was support that program, um, launches and landings uh, with biomedical research and, and medical operations support during that first period of my time. The part that a lot of people don't know about is we also had during that period, where we were sending astronauts, our US astronauts, to the Russian Mir space station, which was orbiting at that time. And we flew seven astronauts as a collaborative agreement, um, primarily launching and landing from the shuttle. Um, this was something new for NASA. We had done a space station program back in the 70s, uh, the Skylab program. And NASA was interested in, in returning to that era of, of space exploration and and um, research and so this gave us an opportunity not only to get that experience but also to collaborate and 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 understand the intricacies of a, a space program of that nature by working with the russians who at that time had the, the certainly the largest knowledge base on how to do those types of activities um, since 2001 we've had a continuous presence on the international space station i'm still shocked today to run into people periodically who will say something to the effect of, oh, are we still doing space? I thought that ended with the space shuttle program. Uh, and in fact, we've been obviously one of the prime partners in the International Space Program, um, supporting both logistically and, and also with our own crew members to, to conduct research. The, there are, fortunately are limited opportunities to collect data on astronauts. Um, there, we only fly so many each year. And uh, they have they are invited to participate in a number of different um, number of different studies, and so some of the data I'll present today will not just be from spaceflight, but they'll be from some spaceflight analogs. Uh, we have one that we use primarily when we're trying to look at long duration adaptations to to a spaceflight or simulate spaceflight. That being bed rest. And if you're not familiar with this, this is not your typical sleep study where somebody goes in for the weekend and they, you know, they monitor them during sleep and then they're up during the day and walking around. Our bed rest subjects are in bed 24 hours a day for the duration of the study. Uh, in our particular group, we've done bed rest studies as long as 90 days. So that's 90 days, continuous in bed, even for bathing um, uh, and other hygiene activities. Uh, until the time that we get them up. Now, sometimes they're participating in some countermeasures where they're doing some exercise while they're in bed rest, but a large part of the studies have been done where people just are in bed the whole time. Um, the Russians have done, as far as I know, bed rest studies greater than 120 days, so it takes a very dedicated group of people to participate in those types of activities. If we're doing things that are very short duration, uh, trying to understand very, uh, you know, very short duration and brief exposures to microgravity, we do what's called parabolic flight. Uh, you may have heard it referred to as the Vomit Comet, uh, which is the, the airplane that we used to, to fly here at Johnson Space Center. Um, and I liken this to a long or extended speed bump. So if you know, if you, if you go too quickly over a hump in the road, you kind of get that queasy feeling in your stomach. Well, that's your version of parabolic flight. And what that looks like inside the plane, this is one of my colleagues, Jim Lohr, and you can see he's, he's, it looks like he's floating, but really what's happening is 
he is falling at the same rate that the plane is, is diving. And so you get this relative to the plane, <clears throat> excuse me, you get this exposure to weightlessness. This is a great way to train astronauts before they go on flight. They start to understand what, what weightlessness will feel like. And it's also a great opportunity for us to try out in, in our area different types of exercise equipment. And this is a this is a very old photo of me when we were uh, developing a, a new treadmill for the, the shuttle program many years ago. And although it looks like I'm running fairly normally, I'm, I'm held down by a harness onto the treadmill and you can see my colleague actually floating there off to the side. Uh, that was start, uh, engineered by the name of Suzy Shimamoto. So we use a number of different platforms to understand spaceflight and, and those adaptations. Some of those adaptations uh, you've probably heard about. We have some changes in the cardiovascular system, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in detail. That's going to be the primary focus of this presentation day. I've also had the opportunity to look at changes in, in the musculoskeletal system. Uh, muscle atrophy, uh, decreases in bone mass. Um, been lucky enough also to work with the neurosensory group here to understand vestibular disturbances and how those might contribute to uh, changes in performance in our crew members as well as changes in our cardiovascular system. Um, and more recently, radiation exposure um, in that when we're astronauts are flying in low Earth orbit here, they're primarily protected um, from radiation by the Van Allen belts that they're, um, so we, comparatively speaking, there's not much radiation exposure, but when we go back to the moon, theoretically to Mars, then we won't have that same radiation protection. And I'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Uh, one topic, which is not on this slide, which I won't, won't talk, I can't, won't specifically talk about today, are the vision changes that our astronauts are experiencing on orbit. Um, you may have heard about this, that um, there's some changes in the eye that are going on when they were short duration missions, they were transient and seemed to resolve off just after space flight. But uh, in the last three or four years, we've been reporting on some changes that are, are persistent and remain uh, in some crew members for months and, and a couple of years after flight. So we're learning some more. Space flight is a, such a unique environment where there's just so many things to learn about it. Um, to give you a little bit of perspective on, on, on what we're doing, um, primarily our work right now is in, in low Earth orbit, which is for the space station, about 220, 240 miles about, of the, above the Earth. Um, um, but there are plans most recently announced by the current administration to go back to the moon and do more work there with the idea of understanding space exploration in a, in a somewhat near environment um, but not as obviously not as close as the earth and where there are more hazards and and some more difficulties in in uh, returning back to earth right away if there's a problem but also trying to understand the exploration aspects of staying on a different planet for a long longer period of time um, many people don't quite realize that although we've been to the moon the longest time that we've actually spent on the moon at, at any one time is only three days so if we're talking about six months to a year or longer, there's a lot to be learned in, the, in that environment. And then of course, future, um, we've been talking for many years about exploring uh, Mars and, and trying to understand that environment more. As far as the human's concerned, the, 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 a trip to Mars is not an easy thing. I often express NASA as an engineering organization with a physiology problem. Um, the engineering group here are, are pretty good at designing hardware to, to fly to other planets, but the human is a unique and challenging aspect of that system. Um, for a trip to Mars, um, depending on the orbital mechanics that you, you, you uh, take advantage of, we're looking at probably a six to eight months trip to Mars that's in microgravity and then a year on the surface and then coming back you know may take another six to eight months so we're talking depending again on your plan somewhere between two and three years and we just don't have that sort of experience um, as far as the space program is concerned we have um, the longest day in space so far uh, has been 14 months and that's been by a russian cosmonaut our own recent experience um, for 
you've heard a lot about uh, Commander Scott Kelly was on orbit for 340 days, not quite a year. And so we're still learning about what are the long-term effects. It's not just, you know, can you send somebody to space for a little while, but what happens to them when they go through this long exposure? And what becomes um, particularly problematic or interesting when you're talking about an operational aspect of the space program is that we're gonna send people there and then we're gonna expect them to start working soon after they get there. Uh, the current plan is within two weeks of, of landing. We're gonna be expecting them to start essentially deploying and constructing their habitat, the place that they're gonna to live for a long period of time and conducting extra vehicular activities or, or it wouldn't really be spacewalks of that part, but you know, walking outside the their habitat uh, in their spacesuits, and so that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, our experience to this point is we land people right now. The International Space Station they land in Kazakhstan, uh, and then our medical teams are there within just a few hours, if not there within a few minutes, and so expecting people to act autonomously, autonomously, excuse me. Um, in this environment will be something relatively new for us. So getting now with that background a little bit into the cardiovascular aspects of it, um, where the majority of my work has been in the last 10 years, giving a, a reference point as far as the cardiovascular system is concerned, we're uniquely adapted as, as all parts of the body are to being in a gravity environment. And so we're set up so that the system has evolved such that when you're standing up or upright, about 70% of your blood volume is, is below your heart, um, primarily in the veins. And you have a way to recover that blood from the, your extremities back to your heart, and of course, circulating to your head to maintain um, uh, your brain, brain blood flow. This is something that's well adapted and you actually stress this system every day. And so if you look at a slightly different uh, representation of this, this is what, you know, in a relative speaking sense, this is where blood is distributed throughout your body when you're standing up. But when you go into space without the effect of gravity, relatively speaking, that blood moves to the upper part of your body. Um, and so your body senses this and says, you know, the baroreceptors in, in the upper part of your body and around your heart and, and in your chest say this is an un abnormal situation and, and essentially interpret this as there's too much blood in the, in the system. And so in the long run, over the course of a couple of days, your body starts to dump off that fluid. So you're not retaining as much fluid and you may be actually uh, you're uh, diuresing some or urinating some extra fluid out that you wouldn't normally do. Now, if you look at this diagram from, from left to right, as far as the blood in the head, theoretically, that's about the same and, and the blood around your heart, theoretically, roughly the same. And so your body now thinks this is a normal situation. And the result, if you're looking at this picture-wise, is this. So this is Commander Scott Kelly. This is actually from his his previous mission, not the 340-day mission. And the picture on the left-hand side is a, the picture of Scott in his the Russian Sokol suit. Um, and then, if you look to the right-hand side, you can see that puffiness. This is what we refer to, you know, the, they call it puffy face bird leg syndrome. Um, so that you see um, Scott's face seems more swollen and more rounded. Um, he experiences this as kind of like when you you get a head cold, you know, that, that puffy, uh, stuffy feeling in your head. That's what they generally experience. Uh, that's how they feel it. Um, but it's obviously much more intense when they first get up there. And, and over the first few days, as you start to decrease plasma volume, you start to then just see, you experience less of that. Um, if you look at this a slightly different way, this is, uh, Dr. Bill Thornton, who is at MD PhD in the early shuttle program, and he used a very unique way of, of measuring this in the, in the legs. He was called stocking plethysmography, which is essentially a series of tape measures that he put around the leg. And based on the measurements he did before flight and then after the crew members launched, about a liter of fluid moves not just from the, the blood, but also from the interstitial spaces, moves from the lower part of the body to the upper part of the body. 
um, using a bed rest simulation, the, the pictures down at the bottom are some some ultrasound images and to, to illustrate this and it's, it's a little subtle but you can see how it might translate to the picture of Scott that I showed you a few minutes ago um, where these are thickness of, of skin overlying the forehead on the left hand side and you can see how relatively speaking that you get a slight increase in thickness of the skin overlying the skull uh, and then conversely if you looked at the skin overlying the, the ankle in the, same, in the same subject, you can see where some of that tissue, it looks like the tissue fluid is, is, is decreased. This is not enough time for, for to experience significant amount of muscle atrophy in these particular images. And so these are actual decreases in skin thickness. Um, looking at a little bit of data to illustrate this, the data on the left-hand side is data from uh, Carolyn Leach, who was a, a scientist in our area and eventually actually became center director at Johnson Space Center. And she was measuring plasma volume changes in the liquid portion of the blood over the, the course of time. This is from a dedicated space and life sciences mission from the 1980s. And you can see rather quickly in, in these subjects, there's a rapid decrease in plasma volume. Um, this is uh, a fairly normal and expected response now that we know more about it. And on the right hand side, you can see that over a long duration of period of time, these are data comparing uh, shuttle crew members to these the same shuttle crew members then later flew in that NASA MIR program I told you about earlier. And you see that that plasma volume loss is, is rapid um, from the previous to the graph on the left hand side, but it doesn't seem to get any worse. So your body establishes a new space flight normal as far as plasma volume is concerned. So Plasma is only one part of your blood. Uh, the other part is, as exercise physiologists, we often focus on is the red cell mass or the, 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 the cells that are responsible for carrying oxygen to the, to the muscles. And um, in particular, this is some data from that same study, uh, same um, Space and Life Sciences mission, the Space Shuttle mission on the left-hand side. Um, these are data, this is red cell mass measuring the same crew members. And you can see that the, the decrease in red cell mass is not as rapid as we saw in plasma volume, but over time, red cell mass will decrease in crew members. And you can see that on the right-hand side, again, from that NASA MIR program, that the red cell mass uh, continues to decrease, not just in the two weeks, but out to, these are up to six months missions in flight. And we think though, that after about six months, again, it starts to normalize and your body, experiences as, as, a, as a normal condition for them. So we've talked a little bit about the blood, this all one component of the cardiovascular system. So what happens with the heart? Well, if your heart's not uh, having to react as much to changes in posture, uh, the idea is that it's actually doing less work. And like any other muscle in your body, if, you're, if the muscle is not being exercised, then it starts to atrophy. And the data on the left-hand side is data from uh, Dr. Ben Levine's group at UT Southwestern, where they did MRI to quantify um, changes in, in left ventricular mass. And you can see in these four subjects before and after our space shuttle mission, uh, that you get a significant decrease in, in cardiac mass. The, the image to the right is not obviously not from MRI, but was meant as an illustrative uh, purposes of what we've been doing more recently, which is using 3D ultrasound to get measurements in flight. Um, the, there's not a real way to, or nobody's come up with a way to miniaturize MRI to do these measurements. So ultrasound is our primary way to get measurements for, for our space flow, uh, space flow participants at this point. Um, just to give a little bit more information about the, the changes in cardiac atrophy, these are data from from a series of bed rest studies um, employing both MRI and ultrasound measurements. And you can see that over time, cardiac mass decreases and it appears to decrease in a fairly linear fashion. And we think that this, again, this, this uh, tends to, will reach a plateau about six months. Similarly, we start to see changes in the arteries, which are also muscular vessels. Um, not so many changes in the brachial artery because relatively speaking, it's not seeing as many changes in pressure, but you see in the, this, the, uh, the vessel in the leg on the, the right-hand side, again, because it's not experiencing as many uh, changes in uh, or the pressure is uh, potentially less in that vessel over time that, that you start to see some smooth muscle atrophy there. So 
So I said this is kind of a space flight normal condition. So why are we why are we really concerned about this as, as far as low Earth orbit in particular? Since you get this adaptation coming back to, to the, the picture I showed previously, showing that you get this adaptation to space flight. But then what happens when you return to Earth, when you're back in that gravity environment, so that you you're operating with potentially a smaller heart with less blood volume? And now how do you provide blood to the brain so that you maintain consciousness? And what happens then is you, relatively speaking, now you have a larger volume of blood in the lower part of the body and it's harder to get blood back to the head. And so we have in the space shuttle crew members about 20 to 25% of them who will pass out during a, a medical test on landing day. And for the long duration crew members, it's a little longer. And I'll show you that data in a few moments. But to give you a real life perspective on this, this is a series of photos from a post-mission uh, debriefing by one of the shuttle crew members a number of years ago. And this was in the hangar at Ellington Field. And admittedly, it was a little bit of a warm day that day, but you, this uh, particular crew member uh, well tolerated the space flight and was giving, you know, talking about her experiences on flight. And she then started experiencing lightheadedness. And during the course of the presentation, she actually passed out um, and had to be, you know, laid flat. And so the body has a great way of dealing with with not enough getting getting enough blood to the to the head while well, you pass out and you fall flat. And so now everything's on the same level. So it's easy to to get blood to the head at that point. But this is a real life ex experience that some of our crew members will, will will have. And then looking at it a little bit differently, this is data from one of those tilt tests that we did on landing day. And, and this is to orient you to the, the top graph is is the is a pre-flight measurement. The bottom graph is a post-flight measurement. The gray spiky lines, those are the blood pressure measurements, beat to beat measurements. And then the, the dark black line in this graph is our heart rate response. And you can see in this particular case, in the lower graph, um, that over time, when this person's standing up, their blood pressure slowly starts to decrease and their heart rate's not increasing extreme amount of so that you're not compensating. And this is a person who actually passed out um, after about six minutes of standing. This is not a new phenomenon I mentioned that we've known about this since the early space flight program. It's been something we've been trying to understand and appreciate over time. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's it's not just the shuttle program. And this is uh, some data, again, looking back at the uh, series of uh, some crew members that uh, participated in both shuttle and the, the NASA MIR program. And you can see that when they were um, participants in the shuttle program, only about 20 to 25% of them would pass out. But when they were did the long duration mission, that NASA MIR mission about six months long, then about 85% of them passed out. And we continue to see this even with the uh, with the International Space Station program. Um, the, the data on the left-hand side of this graph is a, a combination of all the, the subjects that participate in these tilt tests. Again, about 20% of them uh, have problems on landing day, but granted a, a limited number of subjects, about 60 to, or greater than 60% of the crew members would have problems completing the same test on landing day among our ISS crew members. So how do we combat this? Well, one of the ways that we do this is we use, um, we do fluid loading. Uh, this is some data from the, sh the shuttle program, early shuttle program. And this graph to the right hand side is what the heart rate responses are among these crew members before they launch. So you get a you know, normal increase in heart rate when they, <clears throat> excuse me, before they launch. And a group of the subjects, the ones that are listed as with countermeasures consumed about a liter of fluid with, with salt tablets about an hour to two hours before they landed. Um, so if you look at this, the folks who didn't do the countermeasure, you get this uh, increase in heart rate, not just when they're standing, but also when they're supine. Uh, but for the folks who did the countermeasure, even though they still have uh, an elevated heart rate when they uh, stand up, it's significantly less than uh, if they did no countermeasure. And so this has become a standard procedure. They do this fluid loading um, within, you know, within hours of landing, or that's the current plan. The other way we do this is we use lower body compression. And the concept behind this is your, if you remember that graph I showed, uh, 
the figure I showed a little earlier where all the blood was collecting in the lower part of the body. The idea behind these lower body compression garments is essentially you're squeezing the lower part of the body, uh, having a smaller vessel in which blood to collect, and then helping the blood get back to the heart. And this is a picture of the um, garment that was used during the space shuttle program as an inflatable garment. It was based on um, some Air Force work um, and was used all the way through the shuttle program. And then this is a, a picture of the Russian garment. This is called the Kentaver. Uh, I liken this to a pair of uh, like a, almost like a wetsuit material. Again, it, it's it's tight around the lower part of the body, as you can see from this photo. And there are actually laces up the side of this, so you can adjust the tension of this garment. Um, based on individual symptoms. We are now working, of course, towards um, supplying garments for the next generation spaceflight program, our Orion program, that's going to take us back to the moon and Mars. Um, and we're working on a next generation garment. This is um, a garment we're developing in conjunction with a company called BSN Medical. They make the uh, Job's compression garments leveraging their experience with providing similar garments in the clinical population. And these are called grading compression garments, such that the highest pressure is around the ankle and the feet. And then it gets, uh, it decreases as you go up towards the upper part of the body. The idea that you have a hydrostatic column, such that the, the most amount of pressure is lower part of the body, um, where the most amount of uh, fluid pressure would be. And we've tested these both in bed rest and in space flight, and we've, we've obtained positive results. These are data from our, our space shuttle study in the control group. Uh, in that middle graph, you can see um, that kind of the standard response that I showed you in a previous slide, where the, the change in heart rate from supine to standing is about 10 to 15 beats per minute when you're uh, pre-flight before they launch, about 10 days before they launch. And then landing day, you get an exaggerated heart rate response, usually between 20 and 30 beats per minute on average. But when they wore that compression garment on landing day, this heart rate response to standing was actually, you know, the same or even maybe even a little less if you squint your eyes the right way. Um, so showing that the compression garment work, works really well. The graphic on the, on the right-hand side of the slide is, is a composite of one crew member who was silly enough to participate in a series of different studies in our laboratory doing these same sorts of tests, you know, change in heart rate from supine to standing and the, the decrease, you know, decrease in stroke volume uh, when, you, when you stand up. And so these are a series of, of responses for him and on landing day, and you see the exaggerated response when he doesn't wear any compression garment. Then if he wears what we call thigh highs, which are just a part of the garment that goes from your feet to the top part of your thigh, you get some protection, but not, not uh, complete protection compared to where he wears the complete compression garment, which is on the far right-hand side of that graph. You can see how well the garment works. Um, we are currently testing this garment uh, in long-duration crew members. So these are crew members returning from the International Space Station, where we're sending folks actually out to the landing site out in Kazakhstan to do, the, to do our testing in, in the medical tent. And you can see on this picture, uh, a picture of the Soyuz capsule landing. Um, their crew members are removed from the shuttle and carried to the medical tent. And then on the far right hand side of this per particular graphic, you can see uh, a crew member participating in a stand test. This is actually um, Mikhail Koryenko, who participated in the one year mission uh, experiment or, or flight with uh, Scott Kelly. So we, we're expanding our knowledge in this area. Um, these are some preliminary data from that study. And so in these two graphs, um, we've got on the left-hand side are subjects who didn't wear any sort of compression garment at any time during our testing. And again, you can see that exaggerated heart rate response. R plus zero A refers to the, the uh, testing that we're doing in the field. B, R plus zero B is still on landing day, but it's about 12 hours after they land. And R plus zero C is when we do testing about 24 hours after they land. Now, if you look to the graph on the right-hand side, these are different group of subjects, but again, they're not wearing compression garment pre-flight, but they're wearing this Job's uh, garment um, and each one of those same tests during tests on landing day. And you can see in these blue bars how similar that response is to pre their pre-flight condition. And so you can see pretty graphically how well these compression garments are working. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. Um, 
one of the neat things that we're doing currently is we're trying to to take this the science and, and measurement techniques back to the clinical area. And we've been working with uh, Dr. Ben Levine and Dr. Chi Fu of UT Southwestern. And we've been examining the effectiveness of these compression garments in folks with autonomic failure, uh, posture orthotag cardio, um, tachycardia syndrome. And then in this particular case, an individual who has recurrent syncope who passes out fairly regularly. Uh, and you can see, there, in this case, the heart rate response to standing in the open circles without the garment and then the dark circles um, with the garment. And we, as you can see from this, it works slightly differently or effect, the effectiveness is slightly less in, depending on the patient population. Uh, since we're talking a little bit about to a group of exercise physiologists primarily, I suspect, you know, just a little bit of information about the exercise capacity. VO2 max is one of the most measured variables in, in uh, exercise physiology research. And this is data from Dr. Levine's group showing that uh, in, when you're in that space flight normal condition, there's not a whole lot of change in VO2 max, uh, change from pre-flight, which are in the dark bars on the left-hand side of the graph, to in-flight, which is the, uh, the hash bar in the middle. But on landing day, when you've got a reduced blood volume, potentially uh, reduced cardiac atrophy, you can see about a 10 to 15% decrease in aerobic capacity on landing day. The good news is if you do some exercise countermeasures, you can prevent some of this. Um, and that depending on the amount of exercise that you do, if you do more exercise, this graph would suggest then you're able to protect it more. Uh, and we're doing some similar measurements now. This is data from Dr. Alan Moore um, looking at long duration space flight that we can, we get some, in this case, a slight drop in aerobic capacity during space flight. We're able to mitigate that with some countermeasures. And then uh, in the post-flight period during the recovery phase when we're doing rehabilitation, they can recover that over time. But this points to the concern for landing on Mars. If their aerobic capacity or fitness level is lower when they get there, how do we get them back to a level that they can be able to function well or optimally? Um, as far as exercise countermeasures are concerned, something people don't really think about is what those look like if you didn't do any sort of exercise countermeasure on orbit, uh, and, or didn't, if you did exercise countermeasure on orbit and you didn't restrain yourself, then you would just float away as this picture on the left-hand side would, would give you an idea. And so our crew members, when they're running on a treadmill, they wear this harness system, which is like carrying your body weight in a backpack and you run on this treadmill. It's, it's not easy, but it gets done. And, and we're learning a lot about the way to do these sorts of prescriptions. And this is what it looks like on the International Space Station, the treadmill that's currently in use. Uh, weightlessness is always also an issue when you're trying to do strength training. Uh, and so this is a picture of what our current resistive exercise device called the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device, what it looks like now. And cyclogrammetry surprisingly has the same sort of problem. So you obviously have to provide some sort of seat belt or weight, some way to keep the subject in place while they're exercising. And this is what our, our current cycle looks like. This is what's called SEVIS. There are some other countermeasures that we're investigating. Artificial gravity is one of them. So if you can prevent that headward fluid shift and make people look like they do in, on the ground, you might be able to prevent um, some of the changes in the cardiovascular system. And so there have been a number of studies looking at ways to prevent uh, plasma volume loss, the cardiac atrophy, but and changes in aerobic capacity, but there's a lot to be learned in that area. This is what it looks like, um, you know, from an artist's conception standpoint, if you're rotating the whole vehicle, but the, of course the issue is that's a major engineering challenge. So we've been asked to look at other ways to do short arm centrifuges, uh, something that can be in enclosed in the vehicle and these are two examples of uh, centrifuges that have been used, uh, one here in, in Galveston, Texas, for some studies here, and then another photo that's been done uh, of some work that's being done in Germany. You can either have the machine power it, or you can do the even better. You can have the person provide the energy to rotate their centrifuge. And the left-hand side is a photo of the centrifuge that was used at Ames Research Center. And then the photo on the right-hand side is, is a space cycle that was used at UC Irvine. And, and uh, on the left-hand side, you can see somebody who's pedaling a cycle device. And on the right-hand side, you can actually see uh, Dr. Vince Caiazzo, um, who was doing resistive exercise during centrifugation, is doing squats. So that was kind of a unique aspect of it. 
The other way you can do it is use lower body negative pressure, which is a way where essentially you're encased by what looks like a kayak seal at the bottom around your waist, and then you reduce the pressure in the, the chamber on the right-hand side of this, this graphic so that you're relatively speaking, pulling blood into the lower part of the body. And we have done some work with that. Uh, there was some shuttle program work. This is uh, uh, Rick Heeb, one of the US astronauts participating in this, this countermeasure. And then the Russians routinely do this using a device called the Chibis. And you may have seen this pictures of this online. Some people call, uh, call this uh, uh, the uh, mechanical pants. So we can talk more about that later if you have some questions. But, uh, and then there's a, you could also combine lower body negative pressure with exercise. And this is some work that we've been doing with Dr. Alan Hargens at University of California, San Diego, showing that if you do an interval style protocol, um, if, which we depict on the left-hand side of this, gra this graphic, uh, but if you look at the right-hand side, you can see that, and this is a group of women after 60 days of bed rest, you can see we can prevent the majority of that change in, in aerobic capacity. And some data out of Dr. Levine's lab showing that not only can you prevent cardiac atrophy, but you actually may increase left ventricular mass in some individuals. The last part of the talk, I know we're running a little bit long here, I want to talk a little bit about cardiovascular disease risk since that's something that, that uh, is probably near and dear to most people's hearts in the American College of Sports Medicine. And the, this graphic gives you an idea that there are a number of factors associated with space flight which on the ground we associate with the development of cardiovascular disease. Initially, when we went into space flight, there was some, some concerns about just ventricular arrhythmias or, and, and atrial arrhythmias, would that be a problem? The preponderance of data at this point suggests that we don't have any more um, changes in, in arrhythmias or increases in arrhythmias as, as a result of space flight, uh, which is depicted primarily on the, the graphs on the right-hand side of this, this slide. Um, but there was an incident which was fairly well publicized on the during the NASA MIR program where somebody had a, a 14B run of VTAC, which was particularly concerning. But it was discovered later this particular subject had some issues pre-flight, so it was not all that surprising in the end. But so as far as long duration flight, why are we, you know, what are we concerned for the, the long-term health of these crew members? if they're exposed to things like changes in exercise and their dietary habits and increases in oxidative stress, does that set them up for a greater likelihood, not just during their mission, but after the mission of development of cardiovascular disease? And there's some indications that based on some data from Dr. Philippe Barbe from the European Space Agency, there's an increase in the, the wall thickness, the cryo intermediate thickness um, as a result of space flight. And Dr. Rich Houston, which uh, showed some data showing increases in, in vascular stiffness, which he likened to an increase in, in, in the vascular age of these individuals. Uh, some in his calculations, uh, you know, they, some of them came back with a vascular age equivalent to an 80-year-old. And more recently, you may have heard in the news some discussion about how the Apollo astronauts who had a higher um, exposure to radiation that they may have to being developed with cardiovascular disease and, and passing away from cardiovascular disease more frequently than the average population. And then, so this is a graphic from that particular presentation um, showing on the, the left-hand side, the black bar, the average, uh, uh, the proportional mortality rate for people dying for cardiovascular disease in the U U.S. population, the same age group. And you can see for most of the crew members, the red, green, and, and gold bar there, there were the astronauts are lower risk uh, in this estimation than the average population, but the Apollo astronauts, for some reason, were much higher. Um, the major criticism of this particular study was that they we're looking at a very small number of astronauts in, in the Apollo group and therefore may not be applicable. So we've gone back and looked. Uh, this is some work from Dr. Carl Addy and Dr. Tom Barstow. Um, looking at these in a more longitudinal fashion across all our crew members, in this case, particularly comparing to a group of civil servants who were chosen to be similar. And the overall finding from this particular study is that we don't have an increased risk of cardiovascular events, myocardial infunction, congestive heart failure, stroke, or bypass surgery in our astronauts compared to our non-astronauts. 
Um, and even if you look at this slightly differently, this is a graph a slightly different way. And this is the instance per 1000 years um, between the astronauts and non-astronauts that particularly at the, the lower levels, um, the lower ages here, there's a lower risk or, or the same risk. It may be a little higher in, in this particular graphic when they get to be older, but frankly, we don't have enough data in, the, in that age range from our astronauts to know well. We've uh, done some similar measurements in our laboratory, looking at this carotid intermediate thickness, uh, thinking back to the data from Dr. Arbe and Dr. Houston. And we, if you look at the pre to post flight measurements here, R plus five being post flight, you can see a significant increase in this intermediate thickness. But the good news is when we look measure that a year later, it seems to have gone back to their pre-flight levels. And then expressing it the way that Dr. Houston did, this cardiovascular uh, carotid distensibility or, or stiffness, again, we see a decrease in distensibility or increase in stiffness on R plus five. But if you look at the graphic on the, on the far right hand side, it looks like it's, it's largely recovered after one year. That work is still ongoing. You also may have heard about the twins work where we're looking at some similar measurements and trying to relate this to the uh, genomic and metabolomic and proteomic measurements. Uh, we've, as a group of uh, 10 investigators, we did a large number of measurements on these folks. And this, these data are actually uh, in the process of going through peer review right now. So hopefully we'll have some more information for you in the future. I apologize, I've covered a large amount of information in what I thought was gonna be a short amount of time and it ended up being longer than I'd planned. Uh, but you can see how you get into this stuff and you just get really excited about it. It's really hard to, to know what not to tell people and, and what to cut out of a talk like this. But if you're interested in this further, I encourage you to go what's called the Human Research Program Roadmap. Uh, this particular website has information uh, about all the risks that we're interested in with space flight. In particular, for this audience, perhaps some the evidence book, so NASA uh, does like an extensive literature review and it's posted on these websites so to, you you can explore all this. So with that, I'll end there and I'll entertain what questions we can get in, in the last few minutes. Great, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, we um, have some questions online and a couple questions here at the national office. Um, we'll start with a question from here and um, it connects to um, uh, what is uh, the U.S.'s collaboration with international scientists been on this type of work? You had mentioned that we, you know, um, uh, rely on collaboration to actually get into space. What is what is the science look like as far as the human research and that collaboration? So there are so each individual space agency will fund some of their own research. Um, so for example, every six months to a year, NASA puts out a, a, a call for proposals, usually for a very specified topic, and anybody in the United States can apply for those. Um, but through those, we are actually encouraged to collaborate with our inter, you know, other international scientists. So we frequently, like we have a study right now where we are, we are collaborating with the Russians. It's called this fluid shift study. Collaborating with the Russians, we're collaborating with um, the Canadian Space Agency and with ESA. Um, so each individual organization will have have uh, have their own calls for research, but we're highly encouraged to participate in each other's work. Um, not only from the perspective of of getting other people's insights and 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 whatnot into it, but again, going back to my one of my early uh, topics being that we have limited opportunities to study these folks. So we need to maximize the amount of information we can get from them, particularly since, you know, it's now 2018. And, you know, the, the discussion now is that we will discontinue, NASA will discontinue uh, primary funding for the International Space Station. So to gain a large amount of knowledge in a short amount of time, we really have to leverage each other's uh, knowledge, experience, crew members, everything that we can. Great, thank you. 
sorry about that. Uh, one of the questions from online, has there been any studies looking at beetroot juice or I would say any other nutritional supplements for astronauts to enhance cerebral blood flow, exercise tolerance, and or O2 uptake kinetics during space flight? Is nutrition an aspect that you're looking at? So nutrition is, 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 is one of our larger laboratories and well, more well-funded laboratories in our, in our division. It's headed by a gentleman by the name of Scott Smith. Um, and he has a lot of interest in that area. Um, to be honest, there's not been a well-controlled um, study like that, what we're talking about as far as in space flight, but we are investigating those sorts of, and for that sort of information in, in, um, in bed rest and in, in ground-based studies. We're, we're at the current time, we're planning and plan to implement this fall uh, a way to look at not, not be reduced particularly, but we're looking at folate supplementation as a way to modify some of these things. There's concern that uh, with an increased vascular stiffness, in particular, it may be contributing to some of the vision check problems that we're seeing. We think there's a large component of the vision problems is, is cardiovascular related. Um, so yes we are we're interested in those sorts of things no there's not been a specific study on that with astronauts but we're hoping by for by getting this ground-based knowledge uh, that we can then translate that just to, to practice and into to space flight research you know with realizing again with the idea that we have limited opportunities to study these folks on orbit so if we implemented one countermeasure for you know a, a number of different subjects it's going to take a long time to gain enough knowledge in order to say whether that kind of measure really works for those folks. And so that's why we, we utilize these ground-based models as much as we possibly can. Okay, let's see. Um, trying to uh, get the next question from online. Um, no are you looking at um, max intensity exercise to see if T cell changes occur. Um, so that is not my area of expertise. We do have an immunology group at NASA um, who actually has collaborated with, with um, Dr. Ricky Simpson, who is at University of Houston. I'm not sure where he's moved to now, but he's, his specific interest was in mobilization of the immune system and result as a result of exercise. He has a number of publications in this area and primarily in ground-based models, but he's also starting to look at this data from, from space flight as well. Um, I would highly encourage that individual to, to look up that information and, and pursue that. I'm, I'm just not a good person to answer that question well. Sure. And I think our last question, um, is there an increased risk of stroke um, in in astronauts um, with decreased blood volume um, or are the countermeasures sufficient to mitigate that? Um, so if we're talking about on-orbit on-orbit risk, I don't think there's an increased risk because I think relatively speaking, you're, you're well perfused. Um, the, for matter of fact, if you look at some data from uh, Dr. Peter Norsk, his data would suggest that our cardiac puts are a little higher and maintained at that level all the way throughout. Um, and there's no, um, what's the word? There's, there's no indications from the crew members themselves that they have any, uh, any concerns. Um, it just, just nothing has borne out in that area. Um, but as I mentioned in the last part of my talk, uh, we are interested in whether um, the long-term effects of space flight, whether it's radiation or uh, all these other factors, the oxidative stress might contribute long-term to that. And so the epidemiologic data that I showed there was um, data from Dr. Audi's group, where they're comparing to civil servants who really aren't that much different from the average population. Uh, we are now working with the Cooper Clinic in Dallas, Texas to evaluate this more directly and people are, are better matched to our astronaut corps, more high fit, more highly educated uh, group of individuals. And I can say from our preliminary analysis, it doesn't look like we have an increased risk among our crew members compared to, to a more uh, well-matched cohort. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I would ask our staff to um, help me thank you for such a, a fascinating presentation today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.